Good afternoon, folks. Uh, thanks for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to spend uh, an hour or so with us this evening to carry on the business of uh, the City of Charlottetown. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, I, first of all, I have declarations of conflict of interest. You had a chance to go through the package. Does anyone have any conflict of interest? I do. Uh, number one. On number one? Yeah. Thank you. So you'll be leaving us for a short time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the agenda uh, is in front of you. Uh, in front of you, uh, you've had a chance to review that. Any uh, any questions, discussion, or concerns with the agenda? Having none, do I have a mover? So moved. Moved by Bobby Bobby uh, Kenny, <laughs> and second by uh, Rosemary uh, Rosemary uh, uh, Any further discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed, motion carried. Adoption of minutes, minutes of the Planning and Heritage uh, Committee meeting on March the 16th, 2021. They're fairly deep uh, this time around, this, this, this month, so probably a while to look, look through them. Um, business arising from the minutes. Apparently, uh, at our public meeting on Tuesday or Wednesday night, I think it was Wednesday night, uh, Tuesday, 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 Tuesday night. At uh, Rod Royalty. Moving. Pardon? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Do I have a mover uh, to move or uh, move minutes? Uh, move by Basil. Do I have a seconder? Second by. Um, Rich. Rich. Sorry. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? And those are the minutes from April sixth. Not, we're not that we're not the public meeting one yet. No. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. I think the public meeting minutes will be approved by council. At council meeting. Okay. Well, it's on. It's here on the agenda. So approval of the minutes from last month's planning board. March sixteenth. Uh, April sixth planning board meeting. Right, and then right after that, it says minutes of public meeting April twenty seventh. Twenty twenty one. Just copy. Just record for staff. I see adoption of minutes, minutes of planning heritage committee meeting on Monday, March 16th, 2021. Those are the minutes that we have before us, right? Yeah. Correct. Right. right. Perfect. Okay. I get it. Thank right. you. So it's, so it's the ones that are under the, uh, the the minutes that are on your table that are yes. red. Yes. Uh, we did get an inquiry about the public hearing. Right. And we usually, you know, staff. Yes. There's a standard way we do this. Uh, so what we're indicating here is is that we've gone back in. We we think it's very similar. We're, we're not averse to the changing of these minutes yep. for the public hearing. Yep. So uh, you know again, uh, if we these will go on to council. Council approves these minutes. But if, if uh, the uh, the board is aware and they're, they're not averse to this because you know you are a public yes. meeting, uh, we we'll, you know, we just vetted it back through here so sure. that it, it would be known that uh, the. the, the if this there was a, a concern about them yes so but the the minutes that we're asking to remove in a seconder right now right. are for march the 16th uh not april 6th april 6th hmm. i don't see april 6th mentioned anywhere on the original agenda sent out on the, oh, I'm sorry. That was the committee I was looking at. Sorry. Okay. We're looking for adoption <coughs> minutes of the planning board on Tuesday, April the 6th. Yes. We have a mover and a seconder. We have any discussion for the discussion on it? All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carried. Now, uh, addressing uh, what Mr. Forbes would like us to address. Right. Yeah. I think he has intro the, the issue. It was a public meeting of council uh, back on Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever night that was at Rod Royalty. Uh, one member one member of the general public that was there took exception of uh, the minutes that were prepared and circulated from that meeting. Uh, staff has gone through the, the tapes of the meeting. Uh, those were paraphrased minutes that were circulated. In order to set the record straight, the staff has added in the verbatim minutes from that particular segment of the meeting. And therefore, uh, if 
this count this board would like to make a motion to recommend to amend them. To, yeah, to, to amend them. Yeah. I am open for a motion. Do you understand what has transpired? Maybe not. Maybe, Mr. Forbes, you want to right. it, 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 provide it, a little detail. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We, we, we rarely change the minutes. The minutes are the minutes are just a high level overview. We have a citizen. We're very concerned about the uh, uh, the the way the minutes were, were reflected. So uh, we've gone back in. We we've looked at what uh, her statements, and then you can read that in, in the red as to exactly what she stated. It's so close from her point of view. It's relatively close. Uh, so you know we're not opposed to, uh, to changing the minutes, but we we, we typically don't change the minutes. Uh, council approves these minutes. These are for council to approve them. But but again, we're just bringing it to your attention. It, it, it's not necessarily a, a significant significant item, but with the concurrence of the board, we'll just change the minutes to to reflect what was stated on those few items, and we'll send them off to council. I'll move that we change them as per the request of the president. Okay, it's been moved by uh, Councilor Yankoff. It's been seconded by Councilor McCabe that the minutes be changed, basically from a paraphrasing of the minute, of the act, of the activities that night uh, to the verbatim. But just, the, but, 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 but just the verbatim as to the, the, the contested points, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Do, do them all. No, you don't have to yeah. go through yeah. the word. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. And thank you, uh, Helen, for doing the work of straightening these things out. Do you need a vote? Uh, yeah, we're going to, I think, take a vote on this yeah, to yeah, be sure. safe. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have a bit of discussion. Maybe not. Maybe yes. Maybe no. Okay. No. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Uh, motion carries six to one. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> uh, that we're moving on to reports now. Is that safe to say? <laughs> Variances being the first one. Poitier Avenue. And Emily, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, we're looking at Viceroy Avenue today. There's a request for two major variances to permit two new single detached dwellings on a lot that's proposed to be subdivided in the future into two separate parcels to accommodate these dwellings. So the variance is to reduce the minimum front yard setback requirement from 19.7 feet to 14 feet and reduce the minimum rear yard setback requirement from 24.6 feet to 15.2 feet. So this is just, um, if you haven't seen it already, a look at the survey that the applicant has submitted. So showing one dwelling located here and one dwelling located there. Um, so as you can see, this is a very large lot. It's about uh, half an acre in size. It has a significant frontage of about 330 feet along Viceroy Avenue. Um, but this property is unique in that it's very shallow. So um, considering the, the significant frontage and the size, it, is, it has a depth that ranges from about 53 feet um, at the shallowest point to 60 feet on the deepest point of the lot. So shallowest being here, the deepest being on this side. Um, it's currently vacant. It's mostly just uh, landscape green space and mature trees there. There's no permit history that our office has in terms of applications that have been filed for this lot. Um, it's zoned uh, single detached residential, so it permits uh, the single detached dwelling type that's being proposed. Um, in terms of the surrounding area, you have uh, to the north, there's West Kent Elementary School, and then there's a mix of uh, mostly duplex and single detached dwellings on surrounding lots to the east, west, and south. So through the public notification process, um, so of course we notified residents within 100 meters of the property, um, giving them 14 days to comment. Uh, you receive 15 letters of objection through this process. Um, so residents were primarily concerned with the impact um, of the proposed dwellings on adjacent lots, um, given the proximity that's being proposed, especially in the rear yards. Um, there was also quite a few concerns about uh, vehicular pedestrian safety on Viceroy Avenue, and mostly related to traffic generated by West Kent Elementary School 
during the pickup drop-off times. Um, there was also concerns about traffic congestion and, oh, sorry about that, parking overflow on Viceroy Avenue, again, related to the elementary school. So just to bring you right into the analysis, um, from a planning perspective, looking at the proposed setbacks, um, there's substantial um, official plan policies that support uh, this kind of infill development that makes use of existing services near a center of employment and um, the dwelling type being consistent with the surrounding area that's supported as well um, in the official plan. There's also regulation 6.2.1 that's for undersized lots um, in our zoning bylaw that supports development that makes reasonable use of the <coughs> regular lots such as this. Um, staff, myself, um, undertook a study of lots in the surrounding development block, um, looking at rear yard setbacks and front yard setbacks specifically. Um, so in terms of rear yard setbacks, there's several lots um, in that surrounding development block that do have deficient rear yard setbacks relative to what the zoning bylaw requires. Um, because of that, staff can support uh, the rear your sorry, the proposed rear yard setback deficiency, um, subject to conditions, and we'll go through that. Um, and in terms of the front yard setback, looking at adjacent lots, there were no other lots that were uh, had setbacks as low as 14 feet, which is what is being proposed. The lowest being 18 feet on lots in the surrounding area. Um, so for that reason, um, so in order to address these concerns that we've received from surrounding residents regarding road safety and um, the impact from a traffic perspective, we contacted police services for comment. Um, police services uh, spoke to um, congestion issues and traffic violations on Viceroy related to those pickup drop-offs at the uh, West Kent Elementary School across the street. Um, we circulated those same comments to Public Works for comment. Um, the traffic engineer looked at those um, and based on their professional opinion, they, um, it's their opinion that the traffic generated from the two new single detached dwellings would be minimal. Um, any congestion traffic violations on Viceroy Avenue are typical for school zones um, in the city of Charlottetown during pickup drop off times. Um, so there was limited concern on that end uh, from Public Works and their only uh, request is that the driveways um, be located so they extend into the side yards of the dwelling, not directly in front of the dwelling. And that's just to reduce um, the possibility of cars um, being parked in the public right away. Um, so based on this input we received, um, we, uh, our office is of the opinion that the school site deficiency should not preclude development of the subject property. Um, and in conclusion, we're recommending approval of the major variance request uh, subject to conditions and one of them being that that front yard setback be adjusted to be more consistent with the surrounding area being 18 feet. Um, that driveway accesses again extend into the side yard um, because of the congestion on Viceroy Avenue. Um, our office is suggesting that the driveway accesses be no wider than three meters. Um, that's like the uh, minimum requirement for driveways in the city of Charlottetown. So that's just to reduce the amount of curb cuts along Viceroy Avenue. And then staff are recommending um, an OPEC OPAC fence along the south property limit, and that's to reduce uh, privacy impacts on the adjacent lots um, to the rear. So this table kind of summarizes um, what we found to be the positives, uh, the neutral aspects, and the shortcomings of this application, and I welcome comments and thoughts from you folks on this. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. The, uh, Questions from the board members? Bobby. Um, how high is the house that's <coughs> being constructed? Do you yeah. know? Yeah, so um, it's in that little table summary in the report there. Um, they are looking at, sorry, just bear with me one second. Um, they're 
height is 26.5 feet they're proposing. So that um, meets the zoning bylaw requirements for the R1L zone. The max in an R1L zone is 36.1 feet. So they're within that maximum. And the fence that you're recommending, a uh, height of 8.2 feet? Yes, yeah, so that's the maximum height that would be permitted in this type of residential lot, um, within the rear yard anyway. So that's again to encourage greater privacy for the rear lots there to the back. Thank you, thank you for your report, Emily. Um, I have a couple questions if I could just run them by the sure. one time. I noticed that there were 15 <clears throat> letters of rejection. Yeah. Were there any, I didn't see any letters come in that um, were in favor of this project? Is that correct? So there was one neutral letter. No, from the school. From the school, right. but no letters in support that we received. Yeah, I think there was a letter in support. Uh, the last one in, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I might have missed one, but I was thinking it was the last one. It was one from West Kent School that was kind of yeah. just neutral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the last one. If these variances weren't um, approved, um, these are single family homes, so it's just two, two, or two, yes. not two duplexes, it's two homes. Exactly, single family. If this yeah. wasn't approved, is there? They can still build there as of right as long as they change their design. So, um, subject to them changing the design, we have a minimum width requirement for uh, single detached dwellings in City of Charlestown being 18 feet. So, if they were to adjust it to meet that minimum 18 <coughs> feet, they would still need a minor variance of two feet. Um, so, as of right, there isn't that permission on the front and rear yard. But they could yeah. still build with a minor variance yes. versus uh, versus the, the two major variances. Subject to the, yeah, exactly. Okay. And I think, I mean, the applicant's on the line right now, mm -hmm. um, but my understanding, their reasoning behind putting two is just because of the significant frontage <coughs> and area of the lot's very long, right? So yeah. um, that's the reasoning for that. And Debbie can correct me. I'm wrong with that. You know what? I'll kind of miss the question. How I really said we better find you actually the owner of the land down by Troy. So um, I just couldn't hear. And then what was the what was the uh, question? It was kind of um, a technical question, um, Debbie, as to what you could do as of right today on your mm -hmm. lot. Um, and I explained that uh, as of right, you would still need a minor variance of about two feet um, if you were to. Uh, do any sort of redesign of your proposal, and that'd be for one single detached dwelling. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, and just one more. Okay. Oh, so, does that mean that as of right, that long property could only go with one single detached with a minor variance, or could they, um, could they still fit two singles? Yes. With with minor variances. Yeah, they so could fit two singles and the same variances would apply to both. Same small one. Exactly, okay. yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to stand corrected in the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the I, I missed the word not, which is very important. <laughs> small but important. It's okay. Yeah. I missed it. There, there was none in favor. There was Thank a you. lot to take in in those letters. So. Yeah. 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 Laura. May I just clarify one yes. point? Um, you could fit two dwellings on the property. However, the bylaw only allows one dwelling per lot. So in order to subdivide it, we took it through the variance process. Um, she would still require that minor variance, but um, she's, it, the bylaw allows for the applicant to make reasonable use of the lot. So it would be difficult for staff or council to deny a minor variance if if it just went for the one property as opposed yeah. to subdividing it into two and then you're going to have one long linear property yeah with, one. with one i don't think that's not what i that's not what i asked though was it i, I asked that could could they could the applicant still build two single detached yeah, just one because in order to subdivide resubdivide 
we would need to approve the variance because it's it's currently one legally approved lot okay as it is right now okay and so you would have to approve the minor variance the minor variance and you'd have to approve to allow to subdivide the property Two lots, that's yeah. why we took yes yeah. why we're taking it through this process but it would still be minor versus the two major so we could still it would just be more minor. If it were to be subdivided, Emily, one lot would require a major and one a minor. I think it's it would be um, the the shallowest portion of the lot. Yeah. It's where the two feet would apply um, the variance. So being minor. Yeah. Does that explain it? No. No, I'm so sorry. So um, the shallowest portion of the lot. I can go back to it. Go back to it here. The shallowest portion right there, that's where the, the greatest reduction is being requested. So if um, Debbie was to locate a dwelling here and meet the minimum single detached requirement <coughs> 18 feet width, she would need a two foot minor variance right there. Yeah. So I'm kind of looking at the shallowest portion of the lot. And so yeah. then, then if she wants to build a second unit on the other side, yeah. What would she need for that? So that would be like, um, I think she would meet the requirements on. She would. Yeah. In order, that's what I'm saying. In order yeah. to build a second dwelling, she would. She needs that variance, which is what she's applying for now, a major variance to do the second dwelling. But she doesn't need. She only needs a minor variance. For the first. For the first one, and then she doesn't need anything for the second one if she adheres to what the what the regular requirements are. No, she can't meet the regular requirements for the second lot because it's not deep enough. Like this portion right here. But that would be a minor variance, or would that <coughs> be a major variance? It's two feet, <coughs> so and the requirement is um, going back to it. My understanding it's minor. Um, we'd have to do a quick calculation here, and I should have done this in advance, so my apologies. Um, so the requirement is um, 19.7 feet in the front yard and 24.6. <coughs> so I'm literally going to do the calculation of my phone here, bear with me. My understanding is that it's minor. Um, if you folks don't mind, I might um, confirm that. But when I have enough time to just properly look at it, can we get through this so some of that in half to yeah. yeah. Well, uh, mm -hmm. you can deal with the application that we have tonight, or you can defer it. I, I would assume we can defer anything. We can appeal anything, we can defer anything. We are the counselor for this board, yeah. correct? What are your yeah. thoughts? Well, uh, I'll stay neutral as the chair, uh, but uh, if, if, you're, if there's a possibility of approving a deferral, uh, I, that would be, you know, that would be uh, giving you the benefit of the doubt to all concerned uh, to, to re-examine it. Uh, but as long as there's a there's a, a goal, in this, well, if we, as as you two know, <laughs> many times we defer things at council and nothing's done, and we come back and face the same situation in other areas, not in this area, of course. Well, I would prefer myself to understand exactly what it is that I'm voting on. It. Well, if someone wants to move a deferment and uh, second it and discuss and vote on it. I, uh, and right now, the only reason I was asking those questions is because as it stands now, I have a hard time supporting the application um, given the amount of opposition from the, from the direct neighbors. But that's why I was curious of what's their limitation as of right. Can, can the end goal still be that they can achieve two buildings to adhere to? a minor versus a major but if you're not sure I just have to 
when I'm up here in front of you guys oh, doing yes. a math calculation, <laughs> it's a little nerve-wracking. Yeah. So anyways, yeah. um, even if I had five minutes just to sit with Laurel yeah. to talk it over, if you guys don't mind, that would be a great help to me. And then we could handle it tonight. Yeah. If that's yeah, okay with you it. folks. Sure, sure yeah. we can take a, a, defer, a short recess yeah. on this. Or, and I just want to say, yeah. before we go to a recess uh, 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 on it, and uh, I will take a vote, to see how the folks feel. It, look, our development officers here and we as counselors and resident members, we're supposed to be making our decisions based on the official plan and the zoning and development bylaws. We like to hear what the residents have to say, but we still have to observe, uh, as the development officers strictly do, uh, their recommendation tonight is based strictly on the official plan and the zoning and development bylaws. Nothing else. Nothing on letters. Nothing on hearsay. So, and so, we have to we have to direct or, or target our our legislation, our regulations in making our decisions. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Mr. Forbes. I'm just wondering, Mr. Chair. There, I think there are a number of people here this evening. They may wish to speak to the to the committee or the board. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe while they're doing their, you could you could hear from the residents and uh, sure. Is, is it helpful? I'm Whatever you guys think. Right. Sure. And sure. the applicants also on the teleconference line too. Yes. So that's an option. Yeah. Uh, we're going to uh, Rosemary has a point. I was going to vote that we defer, but if people are content to deal with it tonight and you feel comfortable, yes. I'm yeah. okay with that. Too. Thank you. Well, let's let Laura and and uh, and Emily uh, do their calculations. We can hear from the applicant, and then we can hear from the general public, and then we can hear from Laura and Emily. How's that? Perfect. Thanks for your patience. Folks. Okay. Be right back. Uh, Debbie, uh, would you like to speak to the planning board? Um, I just have a couple things to say. Um, backing the door. I uh, just repeat the fact today so I was going through some of the letters and you know I certainly understand where where the uh, neighbors are coming from. However there's a few things in the email letters that are just not correct and they're not true. So I just want to make sure that people understand that as you go through them. Um, there are things that that aren't actual facts. Uh, do you want to give us some examples, Debbie? Or sure. just yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. So, uh, we're going to be talking about me developing this into six lots. Uh, I said, no, uh, no, I'm not doing that. There's also um, a letter talking about this is the third time I've submitted a variance. That's not true. This is the very first time. Um, and, you know, the, the, the trees are, are beautiful. I agree. And, we, um, you know, I would never cut them down unless they, they were right in the middle of where the house is going. But as you see, that's a long, narrow lot. And there's as many trees as, as I could who would leave there, for sure. Um, with respect to the school, I mean, ch well, children's safety, number one priority goal, of course. Um, with two residential lots, so that people working from home in another driveway would, would be minimal, I, I, would, I would guess. Um, and then there was another, another, um, another letter talking about shade um, on their lawn, and they were on Admiral, but the, the, the way that their lot would be the north side, like the Admiral Street backyard would be north, so there's, that would be the, you know, the least amount of where the sun came from, so the two houses that would be set up in Viceroy wouldn't block, wouldn't shade those backyards that much, because that's their north side. Um, east, west, and south are still all, the, the, these houses wouldn't, wouldn't touch any of that. So that's just, that's just some of the things off the top of my head. Oh, and also, uh, I will say, I'm not a greedy developer. <laughs> Someone has been a greedy developer. So, just wanted to point that out. Anyway, and I, I didn't have a lot of time in the room, I just thought that I just got package today. So, those are some of the things that I quickly saw that I said, like, okay, that's not true, I'm not breaking this up into six blocks. Anyway, those are just my points for now. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, board members, any questions of Debbie? Well, I would be, if, if, if I could. Yeah, sure. Uh, Debbie, Absolutely. thank you Absolutely. for Absolutely. sharing your information. So uh, I'm not sure if you were following all this. Uh, I think what Councilor Yankoff was trying to determine is, uh, you know, what your as of right uh, bill would be with a minor variance instead of applying for these major variances. Is that something that you're willing to work with? 
if there is a different size of the home, for example, that wouldn't require as much of a setback? Or are you pretty stuck on these plans? Yes. No, no, I, you know, I don't say I'm kind of city planning to be very professional to work with, and certainly I would work, you know, I would work with them and take their suggestions and whatever is the least impact, but I do want to build two residential homes. Like, I want to divide it into two lots, that one piece of land, and then build two homes. And what I have right now, the plans I was looking at, were 25 feet deep. Um, so, if I have to reduce the front setback, back up to 18 I lose four feet so then it began to 21. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can go you know I mean I know the legal amount is 18 and I can't go below 18 but really 21 feet is yeah you're good. It, you know I wouldn't want to go much smaller than that exactly. I'd have to make it a little longer right mm -hmm. okay thank you but if this your question the answer is no I mean, I'm not always I'm not like this is you know I'm very willing to work with city planning to make it most suitable for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a Bobby? Debbie, um, when I see the rear setback move into 15.2 feet and then a, a building of a home of 26.5, my concern is that that may have a significant impact on the people backing on to the, this, these buildings. Was there any consideration? You mean the house yes. Any yeah. consideration given to building something lower so that it would have less impact? Um, Perhaps I didn't ask that. Before. Yeah, I'm not completely opposed to that. I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the height of the building is 24.6. That's not, that's just kind of, it's not really outrageously tall. You know, I have to work with an architect. Uh, I wouldn't want to be limited to have to build a one story. Although, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm not completely opposed to it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Looking at those drawings, it looks like it's more of a back split. Like, it's not going to be very high. It's going to be down. And, but it can't because the lot is flat. There is no grade. Yeah, it has to be too high. It is going to be two story. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? No one else? Uh, uh, Rosemary. Yes, thank you. Uh, Debbie, thank you very much for calling in for your application. So I drove by the property today, mm -hmm. and it is a very long, narrow lodge. I read yeah. the application carefully, but I'm just wondering, can you tell us what the dimensions of the two lots would be? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, I'm probably better reading this than I am. It's on that survey lot, right? I had them all, I had them surveyed into two lots. Um, uh, I'm sure that the 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 left one is. Two hundred forty-three long and wait now. It looks like one sixty-seven eighty-six. Um, I think. Do you guys have that survey? Is, 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 yeah. yeah, it's on the board here. Yeah, board here. Oh, okay. <coughs> I can't see you from here. No, right. Oh. <laughs> what is it? Uh, one sixty-seven point eight six uh, frontage on the on the left lot, and the right one is one sixty-one point three four. And what's the width? Yeah. And the width, I'll ask it after that. So the width on the fifty-seven thirty-six is one fifty-four point three. Yeah, fifty-four point three, and then the right is sixty point three eight. Now, Debbie, when I drove by today, I, I have to tell you that I found it very difficult to visualize two houses on that property. Just because it's such a long, narrow strip mm -hmm. and, and with all the trees. And um, yeah, I think, it, I think it would be, I'm not sure how well it would fit into the landscape just with the, with the narrow, such narrow depth. Well, I mean, that's what you got to figure out the right, you know, you got the right um, size of the, the, the hole and you just work with the survey lot, right? You know, the, the, the depth is what it is, and then I have to request the variance to work around it. And 
But part of our, you know, part of our plan for the city and for neighborhoods is that new development fits in with the context of existing development. So that's something that we mm -hmm. always have to keep in mind too. For sure. Thank you, folks. Thank you. So um, we have basically, like, getting back to the letters again. The letters covered a lot of aspects of that area out there: traffic and new sidewalk, and and uh, oh, there's a whole lot of things. But the two elements that we're examining in relationship to approving or rejecting this application are shortage of front lawn and shortage of back lawn. Uh, it has been suggested by our development officers that some conditions be uh, provided or uh, uh, some uh, offense, for example, that sort of thing. But that's what we have to stick to, uh, is, uh, is, is what, the, what, what is required uh, to make this uh, project uh, legal. And uh, it's two items, front lawn and back lawn, uh, nothing else. Uh, we, we recognize there's a school across the street. There's buildings across the street on Prince Street and, and uh, Maple Street. And I was just wondering, Mr. Yes. Chair, uh, do you want me to check to see if any of the residents? Sure, I was going to, oh yes, uh, would you ask if any of the residents would like to come and speak? Like an old uh, Three Stooges movie, you know, in and out of the doors, and <laughs> one guy goes out that door, another guy goes in the other door. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, we do. We invite the residents to speak if, we, if there wasn't a public meeting associated with the applicant. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Yep. Welcome. How are you? Very well, thank you. Welcome. My name is Sandra Miller. I'm the Sandra. owner of the home on uh, 40 Prince Charles Drive, and I have written a letter that you have read here. Um, a couple things that are going on. I find it very concerning that you are required, according to the bylaw, to ask and uh, get uh, neighbors, uh, resident homeowners, opinions. But you're sitting there and saying, don't, don't pay attention to them. Don't pay attention to them. Just pay attention to what it says. And we can make a, main, a major variance, or we can make a minor one, and the hell with the neighborhood. Thank you for mentioning the concern about the well-being of the neighborhood. That is very, very important. And I'm very discouraged with you saying, just ignore what people spent their time writing and they were asked for their comments. We gave them and you disregarded them. Shame on you. And I appreciate your speaking. You're very thorough and thinking about it. And I ask the rest of you, if you haven't read the damn reports, you better do that. You better do that. This is the well-being of the neighborhood and people that live in it. Thank you for your time. Excuse me, man, before you leave, what I was trying to do was make a point. We have an official plan of the city of Town, and we have uh, zoning and development bylaws that are the, the instruments that get us, that, that we can implement that official plan. I'm telling the councillors here and the resident members, when they're making their decision, concentrate on the elements that are in those two official documents, not the opinion or thinking of other people on other things that are not to be brought in when you're examining the official plan or the zoning development bylaw. Those are two documents that are signed by the City of Charlottetown to be implemented by this committee. And I'm merely reminding them of what their duty is and we, we, we take an oath of allegiance of office to do that very thing and when we're swearing in at the beginning of the term. And what is the responsibility of this committee regarding what people have you've been asked for their opinions? What is the responsibility to ignore you, them? You can read it, but you don't use the opinions. You have to ground them in the official plan or in the zoning and development bylaw. Right, and the zoning and de development bylaw indicates whether someone can apply for an, a variance. So the variance indicates that there are rules to follow. That, and then within those rules, there's a minor and major variances. There's forgiveness. Right, exactly. But and do these, does this group want to provide forgiveness to the applicant or not? That's their choice to vote on. 
It is, but there's other evidence in here. Like, you, why would you ask? What for evidence? For, what why evidence? would you ask for people's opinions, neighbors, and the well-being of that community, and not listen to them? I don't get it. Like, why? Why am I even here if if you weren't valuing my opinion? We we, we listen to them, but I'm just reminding no, 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 them. You're not listening. To them. You're saying disregard them. Pay attention only to the variants. You That's can read the letters saying. all you want, and you can appreciate them all you want. But when it comes to deciding on your vote, which way you're going to vote, you will use the official plan and the zoning and development bylaw. Very simple. So what I ask the people in the committee here is pay attention to that and turn down this offer to make major variances because it does not suit the well-being of people who live in that community, nor the safety of the children who are along that street. And for I think you had indicated that you drove along, and it's hard to see uh, who had drove along uh, the neighborhood to find out how how busy and how the much that traffic is so I appreciate again gathering some evidence about the actual situation and it is very very dangerous so you know, there's many factors that go into this and not just whether it fits or is suitable for a major or a minor variance there's more to the situation than that discussion thank you I'll make one comment and then again that's saying I didn't actually but uh, I do own a couple of properties in Apple and I own this land um, I do think that the city did does read all those letters, and I do think they took action in particular regarding the school and the safety of the children. I think they took this uh, to the city police and to uh, the traffic control to you know to get their assessment, and it came back as approved as not anything different than any other school um, on the street. So I do think that the city and planning did take action on on the letters. That they said it, and, then, and I think that you know everybody gets emotional, obviously, but I think we have to look at the facts. And I'm very sorry that this green space may not be there for the neighborhood. I wish I was in the financial situation where I could offer the green space to all these people. It's it's uh, I've owned the land for years, and it's the first time I've tried for a variance. I've worked very closely with the city. I I've done everything that they've asked me. Um, I think that two new families within the area may add to that community. I, don't think, I think we're jumping to conclusions to think that two new residents may not, it may not, may, may be terrible and uh, disrupt the community. Actually, the, the school board, the school said that they would love if there were two new families um, in, in those homes. But I think we're just looking at the negative, the negative, and, and I think there could be a lot of good come from this. This is not an outrageous request. Uh, when you've owned a piece of property for quite some time and you'd like to sell it and, or, or even, I'm, I'm not even sure I might build on it myself um, I, I'm, I'm, but I'm not out to hurt anyone or, you know this is me anyway, I guess that's all <laughs> thank you, thank you Mr. Forbes I just checked to see if there's anybody else who would like to speak, and there was one gentleman, he just wanted the clarification on what a major or minor variance was, and I said that Emily would uh, uh, clarify yeah. that at this time. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so... Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you, folks. So, uh, to clarify, we have thresholds in um, our zoning bylaw um, established that helps us to tr determine what is major and what is minor. Um, I can flip right to that section right now, and I can get a piece of that section for that individual to take home so they can refer back to it too. So it's in section 3.8 of our bylaw that deals with minor variances, um, section 3.8.1. So if you're looking to make a change to a setback, um, front, rear, side, or flankage, up to 15%. So that's where I had to do that little calculation to figure out how it's off. Um, um, or if you're looking to reduce uh, the minimum lot area or frontage or building height by up to 10%, that is minor. Whereas anything beyond though that thresh threshold is determined to be major. Um, so that deals mainly with the setbacks, um, area, frontage, and height. Um, so I can follow up with that gentleman too. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Yeah, where does that leave us? Uh, 
Uh, how about we just cleanly ask uh, who wants to defer this issue? Is that what we want everybody? As oh, so the dog dog yeah, so we uh, conferred here on the side. Thanks for your patience. Yeah. So yeah. we had to do it um, like a rough estimate because we don't have a survey plan. We sure. need a survey to confirm. So that's the kind of caveat here. Um, but if um, they were to do a two foot variance, that would be considered in our rough assessment to be minor. Again, we'd have to confirm with a survey um, that it can meet those things. And if it's minor, uh, residents within 100 uh, yards would, or meters would be uh, notified exactly. of the, yep, they And if notified. one person uh, uh, challenged yes. it or yep. for protested, uh, it would have to come here for a review. That's if right. not, it would automatically be approved. You got it. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. And I think that the applicant indicated should be willing to work with planning around that. That's so right. Maybe that would be the best way sure. to go sure. versus having to. Yeah, the only thing we would note too is staff like um, changing the design. So um, essentially making it a slimmer dwelling. It would change the aesthetic of the dwelling. Um, what could be possible in terms of being aesthetically pleasing or not might be a little less. Um, but there's a lot of design options out there today, so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, Councilor Yanko. So, just to okay. clarify. Yes. If, if, the, if this application was turned down for major variances, the applicant can still reapply and still be able to build two dwellings with minor variances. With the minor variance, the variance. yes. Okay, yeah. that was where that come, we weren't 100% yes, sure. Yes, no, thank you. And just one follow-up, if we talk about right now a minor variance being 10% or 50% for frontage, what percentages are we at with these two in this in, these, in this present application as it sits as major? As it sits right now, so they they exceed in terms of the. Um, I mean, I don't have the exact percentage on me. Just know that it does definitely exceed the fifteen percent threshold. Um, I I can follow up with you on the exact one if we defer this. So yeah. Okay, Councilman McCabe, did you have? Did no. I see your hand go up, or are you just no. waving? No. <laughs> uh, oh, say okay. So what do we want to do now? Uh, does somebody want to make a motion of some description, be it uh, a, a motion to defer or a motion to proceed uh, on this application that's before us tonight? I leave it in your hands, Rosemary. I move to defer because there's been quite a bit of confusion and okay. high emotion, sure. and I think we just need a little time to reflect and sure. <laughs> look okay. at additional information. Sure. Rosemary Hebert has uh, made a motion to defer. It's been uh, seconded by Rich. Uh, any discussion? Any further discussion, I should say? Uh, I have one more clarification. Councilor McCabe, okay, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> I know, because it's a lot of information, and again, I want to make sure I know what I'm, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm voting on. So with this deferral, if you go back and work with the applicant, and it becomes a major, minor variance application, mm -hmm. you put your letters out, we never hear, we might not see this application again, correct? There is, if there's no objection correct. received from surrounding mm -hmm. residents, then this could, could be delegated to staff, planning department staff, for approval. Okay. Yes, that's uh, the bylaw states that. Okay, yeah. thank you. I just wanted to. Okay. All right. So, Nancy or Rosemary? Sure. So, yeah. the residents within 100 meters will be recontacted yes. for so, calling or variance. Exactly. The okay. same residents that were contacted regarding this application would be contacted um, if it were to become a minor variance okay. request. Everybody clear? Everybody clear? Uh, ready for the question? All those in favor of the deferment? All those opposed? We have a 7060 count. Thank you very much, folks. Moving on to the next item. I think it is uh, 88 uh, Prince Charles Drive. Yes. So that's all. Okay, thank, oh, thank, thank you, Debbie. Oh, thank, thank you, Debbie. Okay, thank you. bye bye. Bye bye. So, this goes on to council members, right? Sorry? This, this deferral, does this go to council? No. No, no. the deferral just goes back to. U turn. Right, we did a U turn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, next on our agenda is uh, 88 Prince Street. I'm sorry, Prince Charles Drive. Emily, you're on the mat again. Yes, I'm up again. Okay, so 
can pick this up. 88 Prince Charles Drive. Uh, we received a request uh, for a major variance, and that is to reduce the minimum side yard setback from uh, the required 3.9 feet for an accessory structure to 2.95 feet. And that is to permit a new accessory building. Um, so it's a detached garage pool house. Um, in the southwest portion of this lot. So that's a photo of uh, the existing lot there today. I'm oh, sorry, I forgot to notify you. <laughs> um, so this is just, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the quality of this is not the greatest, but um, it's showing here uh, the longer kind of configuration of the accessory structure that's being proposed in the southwest portion of the lot and you can see it in your attachments to this report too, um, this survey plan showing it. Um, so this subject property, um, it's um, 11,570 square feet. Um, it currently contains a single detached dwelling. Uh, it's zoned a uh, single detached residential, which permits accessory structures like a detached garage pool house. Um, on February 23rd, 2021, our office issued building permit approval for the applicant to construct a 750 square feet detached garage pool house on the property. Among other things, um, in terms of conditions of approval was that there be no below grade construction and that being, uh, the reason for that is that they had maxed out at 750 square feet, that's the max. Um, for accessory structures in the city of Charlottetown on residential lots. Um, and then there was also the condition that it be located as per <coughs> the survey plan we received, uh, which showed a 4.2 feet side yard setback. So on March 29th, 2021, um, as part of routine inspection, our building inspector uh, visited the lot and identified a nine foot basement that was constructed and uh, what appeared to be a reduced side yard setback as well. Um, and the reduced side yard setback was later confirmed. Uh, we requested that the applicant submit a footing plan showing any changes um, that occurred since building permit approval and that confirmed that the side yard setback was reduced to 2.95 feet. So it was no longer in keeping with the, the bylaw requirements. So sorry, that photo just shows uh, what the building inspector, uh, they took that photo that day to show the, uh, the basement construction. Um, so you received through the public notification process one letter of support and that's from the abutting uh, property owner that's most impacted by this variance request, so 49 St. Clair Avenue. Um, they uh, noted support for the application um, so this just highlights for you again the zoning bylaw requirements for accessory buildings on residential lots of this size. So it says up to 750 square feet um, in size, noting its gross floor area, um, a minimum side yard setback of 3.9 feet, and then a minimum separation distance of 3.9 feet between any other structures on the property like the dwelling itself. So in terms of this basement level of construction, um, when we brought to the attention of the applicant uh, the violation of the condition in their building permit approval um, uh, regarding the construction of a basement level, uh, the applicant argued that when, when you meet the gross floor area definition in the bylaw, it allows for exclusions of things like car parking areas, electrical, mechanical rooms, storage, and washrooms. So um, the applicant argued if they exclude all those areas uh, from their calculation, um, they meet the 750 square feet according to the bylaw. So strict adherence to this definition would result in the exclusion of most of the floor area of this accessory structure. So it would be very, very low, um, the floor area that would be uh, proposed. So staff acknowledged that this gross floor area um, calculation isn't appropriate for accessory, or well, the typical accessory structures in uh, Charlottetown being on residential lots, so being detached garage, pool house type structures. Um, 
So because of that, um, my colleague Robert Zilke will be, be bringing forward an amendment this evening as part of the other housekeeping <coughs> items, and that's to uh, get this definition section sorted out so it appropriately responds to accessory structures um, and addresses matters such as this. Um, and uh, until this uh, amendment is adopted by council, we uh, must defer to the current bylaw that would allow for those exclusions of those areas and allow the basement level to proceed. So for that reason, we're just dealing with the setback today, the side yard setback. Just to note, it is challenging for staff to support um, this kind of variance request when it comes from the applicant not satisfying their conditions of permit approval. Um, but it is our job to provide a professional objective opinion based on land use planning principles. So that's what we're offering to you folks. Um, so the applicant is proposing no openings on the east side of this accessory structure um, along that reduced side yard setback. So which is a good thing, it reduced kind of, kind of privacy impacts on the adjacent lot. Um, that said, building inspection staff would have to look at this again just to ensure that there's no issues uh, with the closer proximity to uh, the dwelling on the adjacent lot in terms of like maybe they might need combustible cladding or some kind of additional fire um, material items on that wall. So it would need to go back to building inspection, but that could be dealt with through, through the permit approval process. Um, and then we're just recommending for to limit um, privacy issues on that adjacent lot that there is a, a partial fence along that property limit right now, but that that be extended uh, along the whole east limit of the property. Um, although the property owner, the adjacent owner today is happy with what's being proposed, a future owner might not be so happy. So that kind of limits the privacy impacts there. So that being said, our recommendation is for the major variance request to be approved, um, subject to conditions like they submit a new building permit application. So um, planning staff can look at the new grading that would apply on the site, and building inspection can look at that east-facing wall to see if there's any additional fire code requirements there. Um, that the applicant maintains no window or door openings along that east building or that east uh, wall and that there's no encroachments into the side yard setback and then just to note too that there was a, a past lot consolidation that happened um, so we noticed that uh, when reviewing this so we just ask that the applicant registers the deed associated with that and the land registry because right now they have the same PID number but they're shown the line shown on the lot so that's just an administrative thing so that's all from me, folks. So, Emily, we need a recommendation to go to council in our, on this particular issue? That's right. Okay. Yeah. And the applicant is here if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, does he want to speak? Um, he's open to speaking if uh, folks have does questions. Does anybody have any questions of the applicant? No. No? Uh, if he has something to say, we'll hear him. But if not, we're, uh, everybody seems to be happy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll double check, but I feel like if you folks are happy, Okay, so you, uh, okay, well, you can ask, ask them. Go ahead. Pictures are a little crooked in this room, aren't they? Just the pictures. <laughs> All good, but not good. All good? Okay. Thank you very much, Emily. I think you have the rest of the night off, eh? Pardon? I think you have the rest of the night off. <laughs> I hope so. Okay, yeah. hey, we're moving right along, folks, to 151 Upper Prince Street. Uh, Laurel. So do we have to vote on that? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I move acceptance of oh, the staff request. It's been moved by uh, Bob Kenny, it's been seconded by uh, Reg, that uh, the presentation for 88 Prince Street. Uh, be moved or recommend for approval uh, and forwarded on to Sheridan City Council. Any uh, discussion, issues, concerns? Councilor Yankoff. Um, so the present picture is 
that it's in the middle of construction now, is that correct? Yeah, because uh, they received building permit approval and then during inspection of what was permitted to be under construction originally, it had changed, the plan had changed and that's why it's kind of partially under construction right now. So, although I'm not specifically opposed to this, I mean, I'm sure it will be absolutely gorgeous, I'm just a bit perplexed that we're, we're sending along the message that you can get approval for something and then if you don't go subject to the way you were supposed to do this, then we can just come back here and we can change a bylaw or a rule to fit. This mm -hmm. is almost like a bit of a quest. Just we're going to stretch to fit something out. I'm just a bit perplexed, and I, I don't know if there's uh, is that planning principles. I mean, like I say, I have I really have no particularly issue with this. I'm, I'm familiar with the property. I drove by it the other day. It would be gorgeous, but I'm just I'm just can. What is that message that we're sending out yes. to others? So, and that's something staff struggle with too. Like, um, you know, to have kind of asking for forgiveness, not permission type of procedure is not um, how we would like this process to be conducted. And um, despite that, I have to, as a professional planner, have an objective opinion. We don't have a mechanism in place right now to deal with um, building permit violations. So until that comes into effect, we, we really have limited um, capacity as staff to um, control for these things. So as a follow-up, would we ever propose that this, until we have that mechanism in place, we leave things as, as, uh, as is, or do we just continue just looking at things one at a time? I, I, I'm just confused. I think it's routine, really. Uh, say, sadly to say, it is routine in this city. I can, we can all remember, uh, and I'm not going to mention any names, I can all remember uh, he had an apartment that uh, was well up and running, developed up and running with people in it and paying rent uh, after the fact. You know, we, we know where that was and I'm not going to, uh, it was within this, this term. Uh, we, I can t I, you're looking per per perplexed at me, so I'll, I'll tell you after. <laughs> no, it happens right. all the time. But yeah. that's what I feel like we, we punish people who ask the, or follow the right process and do the rules by saying yeah. no to certain things, and then people that apply and change the rules, yeah. there's no real consequence. I, I, I agree, I concur with her, and I know we're looking at having more of an enforcement opportunity or fine based. Mm -hmm. um, Thing, but we've I, dealt I, with this issue three, four times in the last year, since yeah. we've been absolutely and and they've all they've come afterwards. They haven't built what they were supposed to build. Yep. But because there is no enforcement teeth, yep. What can you do? I think Mr. Uh, Forbes well, will. Well, you, you can't. You, you, know, speak you, you to have that. the right to turn it down. I mean, there's consequences to the developer, but you have the right to turn it down. I mean, that's why it's here. That there's there's no the teeth is here. The teeth is with this board. You have the power to grant the variance or not. If you don't, there's some major changes has to happen on this uh, on, on the project. So the uh, but we also didn't give a direction to follow this part of your plan. Right? Well, it's, it, it, right. but but the reality is that there's two things going on. But this board is the one; it's not staff that has the power to to, to amend it. We have to uh, review it in the context of if if they have we we telegraph in great detail what happened here. Emily's got in great detail. We're not screwing over that. But the reality is is that you do have the right to ask for a variance. And but you know again with all the circumstances that are there, uh, but we, we can't be punitive either. That uh, just because you didn't follow the rules, uh, that we have to indicate that if we were looking at this objectively, that this is the status. But but that is an issue uh, for both this book board and council in regard to uh, people that choose not to play by the rules. Don't we have a small fine that we per put in place for the for, it's being worked on. for a building permit or something? Being worked on. Yeah. The, the, the fine the fine would just be one part of this anyways. You all you can do is fine them for, for non compliance with the building permit, but they still have the right to come back and to ask for the variance. Everybody has the right to ask the very bylaw, but you folks have got the right to say yay or nay. Excuse me, Alex. Uh, Mr. Chair, the applicant is out here requesting to speak to the board. Oh, okay. Uh, so where are we? Well, gee, I don't know. <laughs> we are at a point. We already asked once, didn't we? Pardon? We asked the applicant to speak and he said it was okay? Yeah. 
previously, he said. Well, I mean, uh, we're in the discussion period of a vote. What do, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to hear the applicant? Do you want to say we gave you a chance? I'd like to hear the applicant. Pardon? I'd like to hear. Okay. I'm sure. With hearing yeah. the Okay. Anybody, anybody opposed to hearing the applicant? No. Boy, this has been one jerky night. Let's <laughs> <laughs> hear from the applicant. Okay. Okay. Um, here. Oh, he's here. Yes, Kathy Yankov. Where we're waiting. Welcome. How are we doing? Good. How are you doing? I, I just heard the discussion over all of the sort of the variance stuff. And I just wanted to clarify that I'm a builder by trade. Um, we handle a lot of work on Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. And on this particular instance, it's, it's a mistake. It's not a, you know, I wasn't trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes with the setbacks. Um, and if you guys visit the rules from 2018, they've changed. So the previous setback was 2.5 feet. Um, so I knew my, my front pin wasn't visible and I was going with a ballpark um, measurement that I discussed with my neighbor um, before we started. And when I referred back to the previous bylaws, Google brought me to the 2018 setback numbers which gave me 2.5, knowing I was at about three feet. That's where the discrepancy happened. Uh, now I knew I wasn't at what was approved, but I thought at the time it really didn't matter because it was still allowed, which it wasn't. So that's why I'm here for the variance. And I just want to clarify that. And I think, you know, likely that's why a lot of people end up needing variances. They just, they make a mistake. On mine, my hole was just a little bit crooked when we squared the building. If you're squaring it 53 feet long, one end can end up crooked. So, okay. anyway, I just want to clarify that for everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, where were we? What do we want to do? Well, we're halfway through a motion. Oh, oh yeah, oh, we're halfway through a motion. Bobby, move it. No, I, I was going to make a comment. Oh, okay, Bob. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Everything else is quirky. Today. Everything's quirky, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Alana made a good point there about some situations in the past where buildings have been started or apartments have been added to a building. Um, I see there's a letter of support from the neighbor to the east. I spoke to the neighbor to the south, the two adjoining properties. and. Well, I didn't talk to uh, Mr. McKenna. I did talk to Mr. Lance, who's right behind it. And what he said was, oh, no, no, that was just a mistake. This was out in the open. Like, they were, Mr. McKenna is a builder, and uh, everybody was watching this, and nobody had an issue. So I think it was an honest mistake, as opposed to somebody going into a building and adding another unit. So I think there's a, a, a difference there mm -hmm. that perhaps we should recognize. Okay. Anybody else have anything to add? Okay. Oh. Do we have a mover? Do we have a mover? I'll move it, sure. Uh, I'll move with Bobby Penny. Uh, do I have a seconder? Seconded by Chris Fournier that uh, said whatever was said, uh, uh, the approval be, the recommended approval be forwarded to City Charlotte and City Council. Uh, any uh, further discussion? No? Uh, all those in favor? All those opposed? The vote is 6 1. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Approved. Thank you. Um, Councillor Yankov may have to leave uh, shortly, so uh, just so you know when she goes, she's, she's not going from lack of interest. Everybody's interesting tonight, so. Um, now, Laurel, you're. Uh, I'm going to talk to the 151 Upper Prince Street. I don't know if I'm going to be interesting. Okay. 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 Um, so. Okay. Here we are. 
So this is an application for three variances um, for the property at 151 Upper Prince Street. Um, you can see it right here. Um, the applicant is proposing to construct a new three-unit apartment building on this corner lot with on-site parking. And the property is zoned medium density residential R3 zone. The applicant is requesting the following variances to reduce the required lot frontage along Young Street from 98.4 feet to approximately 51.5 feet and to reduce the flankage yard setback along Prince Street from um, 19.7 feet to 10.37 feet. Um, so, up over here. This is Young Street, so this is the frontage variance request, and the um, flankage yard setback request would be along this street. This is the previous dwelling that existed on the site, and I just wanted to leave that there because uh, further, further in the report. So this is the um, the property. Um, this is the current the building that's located at um, Young Street, and this is the lot that they're proposing to build on. It's uh, vacant right now. So this is just another shot of the property. This is the backyard um, where the parking is located in the drive aisle. And this would be if you're in the parking lot, uh, just at the edge of the drive aisle looking towards the lot. Um, so Upper Prince is right here and this is Young Street. So the third variance is to reduce the flankage yard setback for a balcony. Um, which would be 15.8 feet to 7.8 feet. So the bylaw requires 15.8 and they want to go to 7.87 feet along Upper Prince Street. So um, this is a mature neighborhood and the lot is currently vacant as you can see. And um, Young Street is a short street. It's bounded by University Avenue and Upper Prince Street. Upper Prince Street is longer and it's bounded by Allen Street and Houston Street. There's a mix of one and two unit dwellings in this area as well as an apartment building um, that consists of five units. It's on the opposite side of the street from um, the subject lot and it directly um, in the backyard um, to the south of the property on Eden Street, there's also a six unit apartment building. So um, I might even be able to point those out. Uh, just to this side, there's a five unit and then, um, or sorry, this is the five unit and then um, there is a um, six unit like just along this boundary at the back of the building we run right along here um, so as you can see parking it will be located in the rear yard it's already paved um, that was done a number of years ago when the apartment building at young street was developed um, because that um, the, it's the same owner and they share the um, the right of way so um, parking um, it's uh, standard spaces, or three standard spaces plus, plus one barrier free is required for the three unit apartment building. And on their site, they have seven spaces and one barrier free. Um, access to the property is off Upper Prince Street. And I just wanted to point out about the parking because um, I didn't get any letters specifically talking about parking the street, but I did have one call from a lady and she was talking about parking on the street, but I think that's been generated by the property across the street. Um, right here, you can see that um, there's a, quite a few cars that are kind of spilling in from their parking lot onto the street. So the property does have ample lot area to support a density of three units, and the lot area um, for this property is approximately 5,422 square feet. The bylaw requires 1,507 square feet per unit um, therefore, for three units, you'd only need 4,521 square feet. The bylaw permits new construction to line up with the existing front yard setback established on the street. So along Young Street, um, the building is uh, required to, to line up with um, the existing apartment building um, that was constructed right here. So they're proposing to line the building up along this si uh, side of the street. So. The bylaw, the proposed building meets this requirement for the front um, yard setback. The bylaw does not have this allowance for flankage yard. Pre in previous iterations of the bylaw, um, it did allow buildings to line up with the flankage yard. That was actually required. Um, they wanted buildings along streetscapes to be in line. Um, 
So the building that's located along one, uh, that's adjacent at 147 Upper Prince Street is set back um, 7.4, 7.74 feet from the property boundary along Upper Prince. Um, flip to that. So this is a survey plan. And this shows, um, this shows the footprint of the building. And then the building at 147 Upper Prince, this is their setback on the flank at Jared's side. So the previous bylaw would have um, allowed the new building to line up with the existing building on Upper Prince. And so staff doesn't feel that the proposed setback is out of context um, because of the setbacks in the area of the block are far less than 19.7 feet. And they range between approximately 3.9 feet to 10 feet. The flank and chart setback for the building that was previously, that previously existed on this property was approximately 10.2 feet. And that was the first slide I showed. Um, with the um, the dwelling, so this was the original dwelling, and that was approximately set at 10.2 feet on the flank and yard side. So the second variance is to reduce. Um, uh, sorry, just lost my. So staff, um, the second variance is to reduce the flank and yard setback from 15.8 feet to 7.8 feet on the Upper Prince Street side for a balcony. Um, we do not feel that the balconies are a necessity um, and to encroach into that area um, it's a little bit more of an ask um, so we're not really supporting that variance um, it's a bit more substantial there's other things that can be done to accommodate um, that type of uh, like if they want more windows if they want to put a Juliet balcony in those kinds of things um, so they can still have light and um, be able to open doors, but they wouldn't be encroaching in along the street side uh, because they are coming within um, 7.8 feet to the boundary. <coughs> so um, the R3 zone permits single detached dwellings subject to the R1N zone requirements. So a single detached dwelling on a corner lot in the R1N zone requires 49.9 feet of frontage, and the lot um, could easily meet that for a single detached dwelling. However, staff would like to point out um, a few years ago there was a variance approved, um, it actually was in April of 2018, for a five room bed and breakfast plus one room for the owner operator and that was in a single detached dwelling. So it would have been a single detached dwelling operating as a bed and breakfast um, with five guests and then the, the owner's accommodations. So although a single detached dwelling, it would meet the frontage requirements. Um, if a five room bed and breakfast is incorporated, it could potentially be a little more intensive in that neighborhood than this three unit dwelling request. Um, since the property owner shares a paved parking area with the adjoining 11 unit apartment building and it's located directly across the street from a five unit building and has a six unit building that's south of the property, um, we feel that it's, um, it's appropriate to locate the three unit building on that site. So section 3.91B of the Zoning and Development Bylaw states that the need for consideration of variance is only to conditions peculiar to the property or unique to the area and not the result of actions by the owner and a literal enforcement of this bylaw would result in unnecessary and undue hardship. So due to the location of the property in relation to the neighborhood and its context and the proximity to commercial uses and amenities in this, um, in this area, um, we feel that this this application applies to this section of the bylaw. We feel it can be reasonably applied. And there are, there are also various sections in the official plan that supports the application, and I've included them within the report. Um, you're also aware of the housing shortage within the city. Um, uh, the applicant hasn't indicated that these units are, um, that he's applying for uh, affordable units under any program. Um, but it's, it is a, a product in that neighborhood and it is close to the downtown, so whoever does rent it, it's walkable, um, it's close to amenities and services. So notification letters were sent to property owners within 100 meters and the deadline to submit written comments on the application was Friday, April 30th at 12 noon. Um, in total, we sent out 35 letters. And in response, we received three letters. Um, the three letters that we did receive were in opposition of the proposed variance, and they are attached to the report. So staff is of the uh, opinion that the variance request for frontage and flankage area is reasonable, um, given the neighborhood. And 
The, propose, the proposal is an infill development. It will provide additional housing near the downtown within walking distance to the commercial district and amenities. Um, however, um, we're supporting that. However, we feel it's um, less appropriate to support the request for the balcony. Um, so that's staff's recommendation. If there's any questions, I can answer them. Thank you, Laura. Any questions, Laura? Uh, Basil? Chair. Um, so on Prince Street, then it, when it's going down to the seven points up in there, P, that is the actual building and not the balcony? No, the balconies are, so let me flip to this because I might have actually said the wrong thing. So the um, flanker chair setback for the building on um, Upper Prince would be 10.37. <laughs> And the flanker charge setback for the balcony would be 7.87 feet. So I think I might have said the the building when I was giving my presentation, but just to clarify, <coughs> um, the balcony would be 7.87 feet to the property boundary on the flanker charge side, and the building is 10.37 feet. Right. But you're yeah. suggesting then that don't put on the balcony. I'm suggesting don't put the balconies on because they would project out more. Um, um, one option would be um, Juliet balcony. So you don't have a balcony that goes out, but you have like um, doors that open and there's sort of like a railing that goes across. Um, it allows air to come in, airflow, and yeah. I mean, that, that's staff's suggestion, but okay. it's up to the board to determine if they feel it's It is a business street. There's a lot of traffic down there, and so these are Allen Street. So it is. A and one thing I will point out: if if the board didn't agree with staff and they do approve the balconies, um, there aren't power lines on that side of the street. So that's one thing we did look at: um, there's power lines on the Young Street side, but not on the Upper Prince Street side. Okay. I will move to. Uh, Support staff recommendation on both fronts, so that would be to uh, approve the variance to the effective um, point. Before we move forward, oh. the applicant, I, he may be here. Does anyone want to hear from him before we? No. Okay. I think we're okay, Lord. Okay. Uh, unless he wants to. Um, and any residents? I'm not sure about residents. And maybe just check to see if he wants to speak and just see if there's any residents who wants to speak. Yeah, well. anybody out there? Okay. Uh, Councilor uh, uh, McCabe has moved the issue, uh, seconded by count or to President Member uh, uh, Bobby. Um, any discussion? Ready for the question? All those in favor? All those opposed? Six nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Moving right along, we're going on to 199 Grafton Street. That's me also. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not going to run through all the variances again and all the information because I, I know everybody's familiar with it. Um, we've been through design review and then we've been through planning board and the public meetings. Um, but I will say that we did have um, 93 letters um, in response to our notification. Um, 93 letters is what we sent out and we received in response six letters um, in support and eight letters in the opposition. And all the letters are attached to the package. Um, just some of the concerns that were identified at the public meeting. Um, there was concerns regarding the height of the proposed building in relation to other buildings in the downtown and 500 lot area. Some residents felt the building was out of scale. Um, there were concerns that were raised um, uh, about shadowing from the proposed building onto adjoining properties. Um, sorry, I didn't put through. Um, the cons uh, concerns that the building did not complement the historic nature of the 500 lot area and comments that the building should be scaled back to four stories. 
Um, comments and support, the project was a good infill project, affordable housing units are a good addition to the downtown with the current demand for housing, and a building regardless of height would be more attractive than a parking lot. The beauty of an older building is enhanced when we see the contrast of modern buildings against older buildings. So that was just some of the comments at the public meeting. Um, we, um, we are recommending um, for approval of the application. But we are recommending approval of the application subject to a development agreement. And I did outline within the report the, um, some of the things that would be covered under the development agreement. And um, basically they are design as per the concept and elevation drawings presented at the public meeting. Clark Street remaining open during construction and not being blocked by construction activity because we did have concerns from a, uh, an adjoining um, resident that um, uses, that has their parking off of Clark Street and they wanted to make sure there wouldn't be any um, construction activity that would uh, stop them from accessing their, their property. So uh, rooftop patio being constructed, alarms or flashing lights to notify pedestrians or vehicles entering or exiting the parking garage. Um, that was also brought up at the public meeting. Um, there were some residents that were concerned that with traffic coming in and out of the parking garages, Pedestrians wouldn't be um, wouldn't know that they were coming out, and it could be the potential for an accident. So there are um, there are options out there so that um, you can make pedestrians aware that vehicles are entering or exiting the garage. Um, the affordable housing component, um, the public benefit component, would also has to be covered under the development agreement, and that still has to go to planning committee. And um, if planning committee chooses to accept the public um, benefit uh, for affordable housing, then it will also go to um, the affordable housing um, program within the city to, to make sure that it meets the terms and conditions of their program. So on-site parking requirements, relocation of power lines on Clark Street, landscaping and urban design features um, I, we are recommending for this the landscaping and urban design feature to address that corner um, and to screen the eight parking spaces that are, that are located on the corner of grafton and prince street so that's the the lot that's vacant um, just near the polyclinic building we're not suggesting that that whole lot be landscaped but um, there should be a small urban feature like a landscaping feature at the corner and maybe some trees or shrubs to screen that parking area. Um, we required that over on um, the corner of Houston when they built the um, AIM Trimark building and um, that's been a nice feature. There's a small bench and some landscaping and, and oil and stone there. So it just softens the corner and especially where it's in the downtown and it's so close to the uh, to Province House and some of the other historic buildings. We just think that that's important. So. Those are some of the things that we would like covered under the development agreement. And if the board or council has any other um, ideas, then we can certainly incorporate them. Councilor McKay. I'm just following up because I think it was Bobby that indicated one time. Are those spots going to be available for like seniors going into the poly clinic who are uncomfortable driving down? Will there be some space above ground? For um, I, I'm not sure what those spaces are, other than I was told that they're currently being used by doctors for right. the clinic. Whether they will remain as for that use, I'm, not, I'm really not sure. Um, uh, I know that there is a connector between the proposed apartment building and the poly clinic. Um, whether they will have a, a connector also for the parking area, I'm not sure. So. Yeah, I'm just thinking of older people driving into a parkade. Yeah. Some of them will be there. I would assume, Laurel, that the parkade, I think a lot of them do have the handicap parking spots close to the entrance. Mm -hmm. Yes, they would. Yeah, that would help some, I guess. But you can just yeah. <laughs> see and stuff. I don't know if there's something that could be worked out around that, but it, I think it would be. But I think this the use of this lot is short term. Um, from what I understand, the property owner is intending to develop that lot in the future. Um, so until that lot yeah. is developed, I think we need some kind of something there to soften the yeah. streetscape. Oh, I agree with what you were saying, but there are a couple of spaces on yeah. Okay, anyone else? Rosemary. Um, thank you very much. And Laurel, just to clarify, so the 
bonus height uh, exemption, is it the affordable housing component that's the criteria to give them the bonus height exemption? It is, because that, that's what they're um, applying for, is their public benefit, um, right. providing the affordable housing. And um, if they do this landscaping feature, this could be um, considered part of a public benefit too. Um, but it would be up to the planning committee to determine whether they would accept that portion also for public benefit. Well, the affordable housing is certainly public benefit, but I did notice that it's a 10 year. They have to provide affordable housing for 10 years and then that disappears after 10 years. I believe it's like that with all of those applications through okay. CMHC. Um, it's a 10 year agreement they sign. And, and can you remind me again about the formula that CMHC uses to determine affordable housing? Um, that I would have to look into. I'm not as familiar with CMHC's formula. Um, Robert's worked with them a little more on um, the affordable housing, but um, I can certainly find out and let you know. I, I mean, I, th I think I said this at the last meeting. Sometimes I just wonder if affordable housing really is affordable for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to have more clarification around that. It won't be after 10 years, that's for sure. No, no. Okay, so are we ready to recommend to Council 199 Dr. Uh, Street? Do we have a, oh, do you want to speak to that, Robert, while you're here? Go Certainly ahead. I can. So CNHC defines affordable housing as 30% uh, of the median income for the area. So in terms of Charlottetown, that's around $85,000, and that's uh, done um, before taxes. So technically, under CMG's formula, um, there's a range that can occur for it to be considered affordable, and that can be anything from $1,100 a month to about $1,800 a month. So I just want to clarify that CMG's definition of affordable doesn't necessarily uh, correlate to uh, the city of Charlottetown's affordable housing definition, which we define affordable housing as provincially subsidized, which means that it would have to be off of the PI Housing uh, Corporation's housing list. And when you look at uh, what they subsidize housing, they, they'll subsidize units down to about six to seven hundred dollars mm -hmm. a month, uh, depending on the bedroom count. So um, there are instances, however, I will state that uh, a program or a development that's approved through CMHC uh, affordable housing funding through the uh, low finance grant, construction grants, so that's the CMHC program, uh, can also be subsidized further by the uh, PI Housing Corporation, so provincial housing, which then would qualify it as, as truly affordable housing. So just to provide some clarification on, on those two terms. So sure, what could we recommend to ensure <coughs> that these affordable units are actually affordable. Like, what could this committee recommend as part of the development agreement? Maybe, uh, Rosemary, that'd be more appropriate to Mr. Forbes. Yeah, it's it's really the, the public benefits are all defined in the zoning bylaws, kind of like a menu, but then they picked affordable housing. So it's the planning committee uh, that's going to make that determination, and uh, so the, that discussion will happen with them, and it's you know specifically designed so that they can review that provision. But, but it has to do, we're talking, it's kind of a little bit confusing. We're just talking about the, two, the additional two floors. There's another housing program, which is separate from this. The two floors deals with affordable housing. It's more general, uh, getting into those, uh, all of the benefits and tax, tax benefits, uh, you have to be in a provincial program. So, you know, there's a lot of moving parts on the affordable housing component, uh, but, but that, portion is delegated to the planning committee to, to make those determinations as to whether they feel it's met just the public benefit component to get the additional two floors. And then, th then Robert was alluding to there may be other additional d benefits that accrue to it depending on which other programs are subsidizing those units. But what we're dealing with here is just on the additional two floors and whether it meets the definitions in the bylaw dealing with what's referred to as affordable housing, which is more general. I'm not sure if I really. <laughs> but, but Rosemary, we could never get into the realm of determining no. the actual rates that they no. should be paying. But I, I think as a committee, do. we just need to be clear on what we are approving. And oh, if we're not sure or if it's unclear about what really constitutes affordable housing, then maybe we use other criteria like public parking or 
something, you know, I, I guess I'm just saying, if we're not really sure what affordable housing is in a given project, well, I, I, then let's not say that that's why right. it's getting an exemption for well, something. We, we, we are very sure. We understand the two programs. But, but the point, though, is, is that there's, there's these, two, these two issues are targeted at two different groups. One is targeted to uh, the benefits for two additional floors. Council can say yes or no, particularly the planning committees specifically targeted with uh, the, they'll, they'll go through <coughs> exactly what's being proposed and it's different from the ones that are targeted at what's uh, affordable housing to really subsidize the rents and get those rents low. So that's a different, that's sort of a different program. There's two affordable housing streams going on here and I, I know it's it doesn't sound as clear as, as it could be, but, but it is clear in the bylaw as to how to tap into that, that one component for the public benefits. Uh, and it's, it, it's just a mathematical equation. You get so many more units, it's worth a certain amount. Of, uh, maybe this is easier to say. So for the additional two floors, let's say uh, it, it's dealt with per square floor area. You come up with a number. Let's say it's $200,000 know, for those additional two floors. It's likely going to be more than, let's say it's $500,000. You just need to prove that on the subsidization that you've, you've over the 10 year period, you've, you're paying back $500,000, whatever that total is for those additional two floors. So it's a mathematical equation that just needs to be validated. And it's subject to the amount per square foot of right. those units. Right. That's what it's done. So you just take this, the square footage on the top two floors, it comes yeah. up with a number that's defined in the zoning by law, gives you a finite number of, uh, of money, let's say $200,000. So then the person comes in with a contract from CMHC and says, uh, the, 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 some of these rents are, are going to be somewhat subsidized by CMHC, maybe not to the extent to the province, and you need to be able to validate to the planning committee that the that additional uh, square footage calculation has been satisfied. So it's a, you, we're dealing with public benefits here. I know it's confusing for people uh, on uh, an additional two floors. This isn't, there's another whole component of the bylaw and uh, uh, Mr. Kelly's office runs uh, programs you can get a tax benefit uh, for uh, you know subsidizing some units, which is a very different program. I would think maybe some night that we have like this committee, this this first Monday of the month, that we have a light uh, agenda that we put 45 minutes to an hour aside to have a, a lecture, for the lack of a better word, on this topic. Because some people think they know and don't know. <laughs> some other people don't know, but they think that. Anyway, uh, or it, it has to be straightened out. Yes. information. Oh, yeah. 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 So why don't we do it that way? Okay. What, what do you think of that, Mr. Forbes? Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, as long, I think as long as we're, we're, we're going through that right now with the club I'm with, and it gets very complicated when you get into subsidization from the province. Who I see, MHC. We're in the middle of, right in the middle of it, and it's. But I think you're correct. We should not. not straightforward. I think yeah. we should. Well, Mr. Chair, can we attend but, the planning meeting yeah. sometime? Pardon? So could we sit in on a planning meeting to observe? I don't see why not. I, I, I think the more that people know, the better off we are. But I think the background would be really. But I don't think the approval or not a recommendation, I should say, of, of an approval or rejection of 199 uh, uh, Grafton Street depends on this knowledge thing, right? Uh, the, no. No. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. No, I was just saying I'd rather yeah. attend the session than be lectured. Yeah. Than attend the lecture. Yeah, and if you know far enough in advance uh, when it is, it's easier to schedule it. And uh, some maybe some night when we have nothing on. Yeah. Yeah. No, not a scheduled night, not this night with nothing on. I mean, some some night that. Yeah. Anyway. You know, as, a, as a city, we have a lot of newcomers in the city. We have yeah. a lot of people who need affordable yeah. housing. And but we all agree, I think. At the end of the day, it's the families needing affordable yeah. housing. <laughs> and Rosemary, I think we all agree that $1,600 a month is not affordable is that housing. No. No. no matter what color not you think. No. Yeah, okay. Um, now, how far did we get? Having said that, I mean, this it, 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 it gets complicated because we're, yeah. we're dealing, we're serving two different markets. Mm -hmm. There's an incredibly large market, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking at Chris, that are looking for that that level of units as well, and they don't exist. So the, the federal government is subsidizing these buildings to cover that a aspect of the marketplace. So, you know, we can't, the city can't control these programs. There's a federal program and a provincial program. So we, 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 can't, we can't tell the federal government how to run their program, 
and we can't tell the province how to run the program, and we clearly can't have our own program. So we have to massage how these two different programs work uh, and, 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 and how they're targeted. And one is different than the other. Uh, but, but I agree that it, uh, a session on it would be likely helpful to all parties. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we're getting uh, more and more uh, uh, drawn into this issue. But, but that's why these new tools are in the bylaw. These are brand new tools that have been brought in in the last, uh, since 2013. Uh, the, all of these affordable housing, public benefits provisions have been put in. And now we're just starting to get the take up on them. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. And I think that would be benefit to all. It seems like terminology is not correct. Like when you say affordable housing, the public aren't thinking $1,600. No. No. Can I just say something? I think it goes a little deeper, too, for the developers because there's special financing incentives for them to be able to afford these buildings. You know, with the price of everything and, and interest and that, interest rates, like a lot of these projects would not be affordable if it wasn't for that component. Mm -hmm. You know, because then they, they can make their numbers work yeah. a little bit better. So that's even from the, the ground up before you even get to walk the monthly rent. Right? But it's kind of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. That you're so generous, you, you try to be so generous to, to get them for the people that only to find the people can't afford them. <laughs> so there goes the baby. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's Rosemary's department. That's uh, <laughs> health. Uh, Robert. Also just for clarification on some of the CMHC low financing loans. Those rent rolls, whatever they set, they're set for a period of, and it can be up to 20 years. Okay. So looking long-term stuff, the rent rolls eventually, given that you know your your median income keeps on increasing annually, yeah, those those rent rolls will be set at that price for a number of years after. So, okay, thank you, thank you. Now, where were we? I think we, had a motion. we I think I asked for it, but I didn't get one. <laughs> okay, uh, are we ready for a motion? Who's all for a motion? Uh, Rosemary, are you moving a motion? Sure, I can. There you go. I can move now, a motion. Do we have a seconder? The, uh, recommendation from the staff. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Second. Chris. Chris Fournier, do we have further discussion? No. Ready for the question? All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carried 6 0. Thank you. Moving on to the last item on the board's agenda is, I believe, has to do with housekeeping, zoning and development bylaw amendments. Robert? There we go. That's an entrance. <laughs> I was going to say, you need some music with that. It's all yours, Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I will just uh, get right into it. Um, so I'm just going to go through uh, a list of amendments here. Some are housekeeping and some are, um, some are newer. Uh, so I don't know if the chair would rather have me go through each amendment and see if there's any questions after each slide, if that would be easier for the board, or save questions till the end, it's up to you. Save questions to the end, folks. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Everybody. All right, sounds good then. Uh, so I'll just start off quickly with the housekeeping amendments. Uh, essentially, I think the board remembers we brought in the uh, modular uh, uh, the M MRH zone um, into the bylaw. The MHR zone basically allows for modular mini home development on uh, public streets. So uh, we, we inserted that into the actual bylaw, but we just didn't insert it into two tables. So we're just uh, putting those into the tables now for this amendment. Um, we also are correcting a reference in section 3.11, uh, amending to Appendix F, which references the fee schedule in the bylaw, which in represents the uh, reference the uh, fee bylaw itself. So those are just purely just housekeeping amendments, just corrections. Uh, starting on now with the other next set of amendments, it's in regards to accessory buildings and structures. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Emily provided a bit of a of a, a preview into this, uh, what we're proposing. Essentially, staff is looking at um, changing the requirement from gross floor area uh, to building footprint. Uh, and this would only apply for uh, residential accessory buildings, so like garages and sheds. This wouldn't apply to like industrial or institutional or commercial build accessory buildings. It's purely is, is just in regards to anything that's four units or less on residential property these new standards would apply. 
And basically the intention of that is just to limit the scope of the building um, and to the footprint itself. So not counting the upper floors um, um, as long as they're meeting the, 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 the footprint. They can put a second story as long as they meet the height requirement. As you can see, when you're dealing with um, a smaller property, maximum height can only be 5.3 meters or 17 and a half feet. And then that slowly increases depending on the size of the property. We're also proposing to put in uh, another subsection F here, where basically it just prohibits basement. So any act uh, below grade construction uh, for accessory structures or accessory buildings. So that's to explicitly define that there should be no basements on uh, accessory buildings within residential zones. <clears throat> Uh, another correction that we did, uh, this has actually been in the bylaw for a number of years, um, and it was basically to deal with uh, projections of decks. So uh, if a deck is either at grade to a, to, um, a foot uh, or um, greater. So before the previous bylaw had it where it was, um, there's discrepancy between the two heights. So it said um, anything from grade to a foot and then anything from a meter up. So there was a, a big discrepancy there, and I think the intention uh, of, the, of the day was just to have um, that any deck that is at greater less than a foot, and then any deck or grade that's, uh, sorry, greater, or uh, sorry, less than a foot, um, and then that would allow for uh, closer projections. So that's just a correct reference. We're just making sure that that just falls in line um, with the rest of the projection uh, in, in, uh, set up in the table. Uh, and then now the materials for parking lots. Uh, a parking lot is defined as um, any, any space that has four parking spaces or greater, that's considered a parking lot in the city of Charlottetown. So we're just proposing on behalf of Public Works uh, to require that uh, the surface of the parking lot be either concrete, ha uh, asphalt, hard surface. Uh, the reason why they don't want gravel, so we're just kind of removing gravel from this, is because uh, the stones and everything can get into the public right of way. Um, and uh, can do two things, can damage uh, the road itself uh, and the approach, and also it leads uh, to build up and sedimentation in, um, in pipes and stuff like that, and ditches and culverts. So uh, that was just a requirement that uh, Hope Works wanted us to insert. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, the Appendix A definitions, um, because we're including uh, footprint as a defined term uh, in the uh, accessory buildings table, we define footprint as uh, the area of the building on a lot, including land over which the building projects, but excluding any area below the eaves of a roof and any portion that's not covered by a roof, such as um, uh, unsheltered steps, verandas, or decks. Um, and then another thing we've included is multi unit dwelling. Uh, we're now amending that instead of four or more dwelling units, it's three or more dwelling units. So when you look at the definitions in the bylaw under dwelling unit, um, we had single defined, we had two unit defined as either semi or duplex, and then we skipped all the way to multi uh, uh, unit, which was four or greater. So we're just going back to amend and recognize like three classes, three units. So um, that's basically the end of the amendments. If you have any questions, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Any questions for Robert? I, I think it's based on uh, on the. Uh, for the asphalt driveway, mm. why would it be four spots as compared to two or three? Or? That was just kind of how the bylaws always um, defined what a parking lot is. So currently, if you had, say, a single detached dwelling, um, you could still have used gravel uh, for your for your driveway if, if you wish. So that would be fine. It's just when we start to get into uh, larger parking areas in which um, the requirement would then step up to saying you have to hard surface it with asphalt or concrete or something of that, that nature. Okay, Robert? This is just to go to public oh, uh, right? This is just to go to public house. Yeah, this is just to go to public house, okay. uh, I don't Robert? understand um, the footprint. What about an overhang? Yeah, so basically excludes any, so it excludes kind of any overhang, but we do <coughs> have overhangs in the table, actually in the projections table here. So we do have um, decks. So we would deal with any decks or anything like overhang or any porches that would then divert to, to the projection table. So that's what we would deal with. And so you can project a little more usually. It depends on what the yard they're projecting into, but that would still allow for projections. We would just be dealing with the footprint as, as the structure, the foundation or the pad itself. So wall to wall. Yeah. Thank you.
Anyone else? Councilman Kate? No, I was just going to move that we accept our minutes to get this. So that the intent is to uh, go to the public uh, consultation process. Been moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor uh, or uh, Resident Reg. No, that we, in. pardon? I'm not voting in yet. <laughs> uh, that the uh, uh, Roberts uh, amendments to uh, certain bylaws be uh, forwarded to uh, the public consultation process. Right, Robert? Correct. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Ready for the question? All those in favor? All those opposed? That's six zero. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. And just before you close, uh, I should have, you know, it was a busy night, uh, but I just thought I would pass on to you that Emily just recently won a competition mm -hmm. here at the city, so she was just here on contract. Some of you may not know that, so she's got a permanent position. Good. Uh, Good. 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 I think she's gone, and I, you know, I should have done that when she was here, but but again, I. Uh, some of the people internally know that, but for you, uh, other members who may she's, not know that. I she's think that happens. She's permanent. She knocked out for her. <laughs> <laughs> when that happens, when a, a development officer is appointed after being a contract, I think the person takes the board out to dinner. You ready for the question? You ready for the question? Okay, uh, any other business? No other business? I draw a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councilor McCabe, second by uh, resident member Reg. <laughs> all those in favor, all those opposed, we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.